Okay, hello there. Um, as some of you know, I am in the process of trying to get a film made. Um, this has been something that I've been working on for uh, a couple of years. Basically, in fact, more than a couple of years. Uh, it must be about six years ago when I wrote a short uh, when I was on an airplane journey, I had this idea for a film. Um, and then I worked on it for a bit. I made it into a play. Uh, and then I wanted to make it into a film. Um, and after a while, I just put it into a box and forgot all about it. But I recently revived the project. And just two days ago, I set up a Kickstarter to raise some money to make the short. Uh, so we're trying to raise $22,000. Uh, to make a very high quality short version of the film, which, and I, I know I say film wrong, it's a Northern Irish thing, um, but just, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I'll say movie, I'll be American, a movie, a short movie. Um, and uh, the idea, make a high quality short, uh, and then uh, hopefully that'll be a stepping stone towards making the feature length version of it. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can be part of this journey with me and uh, go on to my Kickstarter. There's lots of rewards if, you're, uh, if you want to contribute. Uh, like for $15, you can just get, you'll get a link to the film when it's done, so you'll be able to see it. Um, you'll also, there, for a little bit more, you can have a private lecture, uh, online lecture, where I talk about the themes. Um, you can also get your hands on the script. You can get your hands on my limited edition pins, the Happy Reaper pin and the, the Absurd Cross pin. Uh, you can be an executive producer. You can stay in the luxury hotel that the film's actually based on. Um, you can have, uh, with that, tickets to the Wake Festival. There's lots of different rewards. So go on, have a little look. Hopefully you'll get involved. Um, it's been two days since I launched it, and we have reached 15% of our goal. So it's, we have to get 100% or bust. So if you put money in and we don't hit 100%, you'll get your money back. Hence, it's a good risk. Throw your money in, chances are you'll get it back. Uh, but hopefully you won't. Hopefully we'll raise the money and uh, we'll be able to get it made. So the film itself um, is theological in nature. It's a thriller, it's about desire, um, uh, I won't tell you too much about it because you can go into the Kickstarter and read more. But in a nutshell, two people have had an affair. This very passionate and short-lived affair that's cut short because the woman's husband discovers it. And he says to the man, if you ever see my wife again, you're dead. But as luck would have it, um, or fate would have it, they get to spend one hour together. Uh, about you know, five years after their affair. And during that time, they have to decide whether they want to stay the night together in this hotel, sleep together, or whether they just spend an hour talking and at the end of it, he leaves and never sees her again. But if he stays the night, he will die. So he either walks away, never sees her again, or he spends one night with her and loses his life. So this is the kind of premise of the film. Um, now, <coughs> in order to kind of get to the heart of what I'm trying to explore, uh, let's use an example. This is a true example. Um, there's, there's lots of people who have experienced what I'm about to say. Um, let's take um, a couple, and we'll call them Jack and Jill, right? Now, Jack and Jill have been married for 15 years. Uh, Jill no longer desires Jack. Uh, you know, her desire for Jack is just not there. She doesn't have a sexual desire for him. You know, they get on well, but her desire is pretty much dormant. Um, and then Jack, his desire is for somebody else. So let's call her Snow White. So Jack desires this other person, this woman called Snow White. Um, he has an affair with Snow White and it's discovered. So, okay, what happens now? Well, if you're an alien from outer space and you watch this, you might think, okay, this relationship's over, right? You know, Jack had an affair. Uh, he feels guilty. Jill feels that she's been deceived, is angry, frustrated. Uh, you know, he's thinking of moving out. She wants him to move out. This relationship is over. 
So that's what you might imagine if you were looking at this from some we some kind of otherworldly perspective. But as we all know, um, this rarely happens. And in this example, something else occurs. Uh, at a conscious level, Jack is about to move out of the house. And Jill is saying, you've got to leave. And yet, within a week, Jill is desiring Jack. Uh, they're sleeping together. Jack is still in the same house and Snow White is out of the picture, okay? Now, we will need to analyze what's going on in this because consciously, these two people want to separate, but unconsciously, their desire for each other has been fueled by this triangle that's been created. Uh, now, this brings us to something I've talked about before, which has been, you know, the object of desire and the object cause of desire. So if you want to go back to previous Facebook Lives, you can hear me talk about that. But basically, desire has two parts. There are the things that we desire, and there are the things that make us desire what we desire. So the object of desire is what you want, and the object cause of desire is what makes you really, really want it. And the object cause of desire is, is basically that which is an obstacle, right? So in this analogy, of Jack and Jill and Snow White. Uh, let's take Jack first. For Jack, the object of desire is Snow White. And the object cause of his desire is Jill. Because Jill is the impossibility. He's always saying to Snow White, we can't be together. This is impossible. You know, this is a fantasy. I'm married. There's no way I'm leaving my family in order to be with you. Right? So Jill represents the obstacle to him being with Snow White. Uh, and actually then that makes him really desire Snow White. Because the moment that the affair is found out and he is moving out and he can actually be with Snow White, he doesn't want to be anymore. Right? The desire for Snow White is fueled by her very impossibility. The moment that she becomes possible the, is the moment when he goes, well, I don't want to be with her. This is just a fantasy. This is not something that I want to pursue. It's the very impossibility that makes that, that desirable in the first place. So then, oh, and by the way, then what happens is Jill becomes the object of desire and Snow White the object cause. Because now he has to move out. He's going to lose his partner. Um, she is out of reach um, because of Snow White. So his desire is now focused on Jill. Now, that's a typical obsessive. The obsessive is the one who has impossible desire, i.e. they desire what's impossible. They desire what is out of reach. And it's the very fact that something's out of reach which makes it desirable. Now, in this example, Jill um, is acting like a typical hysteric. So for Jill, her desire is sparked off by Snow White. So for her, um, the object of desire is now Jack. She starts to desire her partner again. And the object cause is Snow White um, because she is the one who is taking her husband away. Right? Her, her husband's desire is going elsewhere. So for Jill, she becomes obsessed with Snow White, starts to stalk her, look at Facebook, you know, try to find out as much as she can about Snow White. Um, her, she, be, she becomes obsessed, in a sense, with this other. Um, and so her desire, which has been laying dormant, is, is set in motion again. So in this, and this is something that has happened numerous times. You know. So this, this, by the way, as I've been, you know, I know four or five couples who have had this experience. Um, it's, a, it's a very common kind of experience. Um, and the question, of course, part is, is why do we put ourselves through this? You know, why do we actually um, continue to exist in types of relationships like this that are ultimately painful for everybody concerned? destructive for everybody concerned. Um, 
now you know that takes us into uh, maybe territory that we should explore um, at another time. But actually, I'll say one thing about it. Um, what's interesting is that the very failure of these systems to work for us is actually what makes them strong. So both Jack and Jill are looking for a way to resolve the tension of, of, of life, to resolve the tension of not getting what you want. Okay, so for Jack, he thinks that if he could have something that's just over the horizon that he doesn't have, then everything will be fine. He doesn't think that consciously necessarily, but on an unconscious level, he is driven by a thing that if only he could have, then everything would be great. Uh, Jill, on the other hand, is doing the approach of shutting down desire. She is going, the way to get rid of the, the suffering of life is through extinguishing your desire, right? So these are actually two very popular strategies in society, right? There are the strategies, the religions, sacred and secular, that promise you can have wholeness, completeness, everything you want, everything you desire, right? And there are religions, sacred and secular, which say we will give you strategies to get rid of your desire, to extinguish desire so that you don't feel a frenetic uh, you know, pursuit of life so you can get out of the wheel of existence. Right? These are two common things. One you can call the religion of hedonism, uh, the other the religion of nihilism. And, uh, you know, as I say, they're, they're everywhere. Um, you find them in religion, you find them in secular society. And their power is precisely not in their success. Their power lies in their fundamental failure to give us what we want. Um, this is something a, a, a theorist, Todd, a Todd McGowan, talks about in his books, um, his most recent one, Capitalism and Desire, which is a very good book, where he says that, <coughs> um, that actually the power of a system that says you can be happy, whole, and complete if only you get Snow White, uh, it works because it doesn't work. We, it doesn't work, so we keep coming back to it. Think of a church like Joel Wolstein's church. People go, well, why, does it, why do people keep going when it patently doesn't work, Right. You know, that's the question you have to ask. Why, why do so many thousands and hundreds of thousands of people continue to respond to this message when um, it's obviously oppressive to them? Well, the answer psychoanalytically is precisely because it doesn't work. If it did work, it would fail. And what I mean by that is if, this, if prosperity gospel worked and gave you everything materially that you needed, you would discover that it doesn't actually fulfill your desire. It doesn't actually existentially work. Yes, you get all this material stuff, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't actually fill the existential gap in your being. So it, in its very success, you would be freed from it because it would fail. But because it continually fails for most pe people, it draws us back and back and back to it. And the same goes on the other side. Uh, people engage in all sorts of New Age practices designed to get rid of your desire. Uh, but the fact is, they basically keep failing. You, no matter how much meditation you do, you, know, you come back and you're still jealous, you still have bitterness, you still have material desires, they spring up. And it's exactly the failure which makes you go back and do more meditation and more reflection and more retreats. If actually that strategy was successful and you got rid of your libidinal desire, the system would fail because then you would discover basically a form of extreme depression. You would find life is completely devoid of all color. You've got no enjoyment left. You know, the very fact that it fails and something sparks off your desire is, is, is kind of like, you know, kind of what you ultimately want. You want some sort of desire. So uh, here, Jack and Jill uh, are just two examples of two strategies of trying to cope with the absurdity of the, the suffering of existence. Now, this is captured very beautifully in the story of Oedipus. 
you know, when Freud uses Oedipus to describe a basic um, experience of being human, this is what he's describing. Uh, Oedipus wants to have sex with his mum. He doesn't know it's his mum, but he wants to have sex with his mum. And his father is a prohibition, stands in the way of, of the two. So he kills the father to sleep with his mother. Uh, the father represents what's called the incest taboo. Um, now, what this basically means is the object cause of desire is the father who's getting in the way, and the object of desire is the mother. The mother represents the oceanic experience of oneness, completeness, and wholeness. You get back to that experience of oneness. Uh, breaking through the object cause of desire, breaking through the prohibition, you get what you want, and it's a disaster, it's a curse, which is the idea of the Oedipus complex. The person thinks it's going to be a blessing, but it's a curse. Right? So for Jack, he, he wants to break through the prohibition, and get uh, what he wants, not realizing it's the prohibition that makes him want it. And for Jill, she wants to shut down the whole thing and, and, not, and not pursue the object of desire. Uh, as I've talked about elsewhere, um, the story of Adam and Eve is, an, is a Jewish Oedipal story. You've got the same thing, Adam and Eve are walking around the garden, there's a piece of fruit and there's a father's prohibition. And they break through the prohibition to eat the fruit so that they can be like God, which means to be whole and complete. They think it's going to be a blessing, but it's a curse. So this, this, I, this, this dilemma is actually at the core of, um, is a theological dilemma. It's a theological dilemma that stands at the very beginning of the Jewish text. And it's really, in a sense, I think Christianity is a response to this this dilemma and it is this dilemma that i explore in the movie making love uh, for both the man and the woman they're both kind of i suppose potentially obsessive uh, the husband is is the object cause is the is the thing that gets in the way of them being together so the question of the movie is whether it's actually the husband who makes them want to be together and generates the excessive desire. And then how do we resolve this complex? What is the answer? Uh, and that's, what, that's why the movie is at heart um, a theological movie, because it um, explores this theme. It kind of relives the whole Adam and Eve thing, um, and it attempts to articulate uh, the, the kind of response, what the cure is, what salvation is. Uh, of course, this has connotations for us in our individual relationships. It also has connections and connotations for us in religion, in politics. You know, of course, I, I already mentioned that, you know, prosperity gospel, the question of why do we give ourselves to oppressive religious systems? We've also got the question of why would we give ourselves to obviously oppressive political systems? Um, and uh, whenever they obviously feel they don't work. But then, of course, what I'm saying is actually that is their very power. Their very power is in their inability to work. Um, and then the question for us, because this generates all manner of problems for us. It destroys us. It destroys other people. It destroys the environment. This, this dilemma um, is, is at the core of a, a fundamentally and profoundly human um, problem uh, that, that can theologically be called sin. Um, and uh, uh, the, the question then for us is then how do we, in a sense, respond to that? So that's what the movie is about. Uh, it's called Making Love uh, because that term used to be um, about getting, you know, two people would be going out and they'd have a chaperone and the chaperone would keep them apart. But actually the chaperone wasn't really there to keep them apart. The chaperone was there to get them to fantasize about what they could do if the chaperone wasn't there. So the chaperone was literally making love. The, the very thing that was getting in the way of the relationship is the, was the very thing that was feeding the relationship itself. So the movie is kind of like exploring some of those themes. All right, so if you have any questions or thoughts, do let me know. I'll try and respond to them very quickly. Um, I'm just going to look at some of the comments here. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, John says, so what is your advice for Jack uh, regarding taking action with Snow White? Um, <coughs> um, so, well, so in that example, everything's already happened. Um, what, what you're seeing is, uh, well, yeah, what you're seeing with the obsessive Jack is his desire for the impossible. So, um, yeah, the dilemma for Jack and, and for most of us is then how, how do you have the object and the object cause in one location rather than in two locations? Um, and that would require psychoanalysis and a lot of reflection and whatnot. Um, I do have a friend who psychoanalyst said to him, you know, you keep talking about not having an affair. Uh, you should take that off the table. Now, the analyst wasn't saying you should have an affair, but what the analyst was hinting at is that actually the prohibition, the always telling yourself you're not going to have an affair can generate the actual desire to have one. And weirdly, the moment that you take that off the table and are able to talk about that in your relationship with the other person, so, so you and your partner talk about you know, desire and affairs and bring it all to the surface and in a sense, allow each other to express that. That in and of itself can take away a lot of the desire for it. So I guess the answer there then is my advice to Jack might be, uh, you know, don't keep saying I'm not going to have an affair with Snow White. Find a way of having that conversation with your partner um, and talking about it which is very, very difficult. That often means getting a mediator. That's why a lot of couples have to go to somebody else because they need to have that conversation in the space which isn't going to blow up. Um, so yeah, that might be the way. Um, definitely, because then at the end of that conversation, the couple might either go, all right, we just needed to talk about this and that helps. Or they may go, we have to, uh, we have to break up. Um, but either way, that's better than the alternative. Let's see. Uh, Seth quotes Pascal. Uh, we are only truly happy when daydreaming about future happiness. That's very good. Yes. Um, yeah, Schopenhauer has this great quote, paraphrasing like yourself, Seth, uh, where he says that um, in philosophy, people think that evil, they call it a negation that doesn't exist. Evil is the absence of good. But Schopenhauer says, no, 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 it's good that is a negation. It's good doesn't exist. Good exists only as a fantasy. As soon as you get it, it's kind of rubbish. Um, so in a sense, it's always, uh, it's always still to come. Um, and then Lacan calls that uh, jouissance. Um, so the challenge is for human beings is how can we enjoy not having our enjoyment, which of course is a theme I've I've talked about a lot in the past, uh, enjoying what you don't have, which is a book that Todd McGowan wrote. Uh, and then Jake asks me, what's, my, what's your take on oceanic feeling? Um, I, I think there are, there are moments when most of us have these experiences of an oceanic oneness. They are very possible. Um, but the funny thing is they're not generally good. Um, if you're psychotic, for example, they're horrific. Um, for a psychotic, it's a, they, the, the sense of the loss of ego in a type of oneness where there's no separation between you and everything around you, uh, where, you know, in a sense, you feel like you're not in your body. Uh, it can be quite, quite terrible. And actually, for a lot of psychotics, the work is to try to have in-body experiences. You know, you're at a restaurant, if, you're, if you suffer from psychotic symptoms and you're reading a menu, and then you feel that you're one with the menu and you're in the menu. And all of these experiences can be quite, quite traumatizing. But mostly what I would say is that, that it's, it's the desire for oceanic experience. It, that's the problem. Um, it's not, it's, you know, having these passing moments uh, can, be, can be pleasurable. Having too many of them can be traumatic. Um, but actually what were the real, the real, um, depth and pleasure of life is in is actually in embracing the um the lack of that embracing the antagonisms of life and the struggles of life uh so yeah so oceanic experience isn't even necessarily that pleasurable i say occasionally it's nice to have those moments when you know you've 
you've had a great meal and you've had a great conversation with someone, you feel like, you know, your ego is dissolved away and that's kind of quite wonderful. But these are fleeting moments. And I would say that they are, the, the problem for us is we start to fantasize that, oh, if only we could live in that space forever. But actually the enjoyment of life, the trick of the enjoyment of life, what C.S. Lewis called joy, is enjoying the struggle of life itself. Uh, oh, Lisa says she just interviewed Todd. Oh, fantastic for uh, Spark My Muse podcast. So I would recommend everybody uh, listen to that. Um, that's, that's really cool to, to know that you did that. Well, very cool. Um, oh yeah. Scott from the Holy Heretics is saying he's going to help us get this project funded. Listen, Scott, I really appreciate it. I read online yesterday that, um, this, this, uh, kind of website says that I've got a 1% chance of success. It just kind of like it's, it accumulates data from all Kickstarter projects and works out your probability of it working. So we're on 1%. Technically, I've been told that you should always pretend um, that things are going well. People love success. If you say we're really close, we're really close, people get behind it. But if you tell people there's virtually no chance, it puts people off. But that doesn't work for me. I like it whenever there's virtually no chance. So there's virtually no chance we'll make this happen. You have to get involved. So let's do it. Um, and thank you, Holy Heretics, for helping me out. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, of Seth, stop quoting great things. <laughs> Seth has also quoted Nietzsche, who said, ultimately, it is the desire and not the desired that we love. Um, yeah, there, there's this idea that, that actually, you know what, the reason why this couple, Jack and Jill and Snow White, stay in the relationship is partly because what we really want is desire itself. We think we want the satisfaction of desire. We, you know, Jack wants to be with Snow White and be satisfied. Jill wants to shut her libidinal desire down and therefore, in a sense, be satisfied. Uh, what we do want is desire itself because it's difficult. But actually, that's kind of what we do want. We just want it in a way that's enjoyable and not painful. There's the painful longing of wanting something you don't have. But there's also this lovely longing for something you don't have, which actually inspires you. Like you want your kid to go to university. They're not at university. So you've got a longing for them to be at university. You might either go, this is terrible, awful, what do I do? And you get anxiety. You stay up late at night worrying about it. Or you get excited and you go to the library and you get out books and you start saving money in a bank account. And you, know, you do all of these things to try and make it happen. Uh, you know, one of them is a longing that is painful and one of them is a longing that is pleasurable. And of course, at the end of the day, hopefully your kid goes to university, but actually that will be a good moment and it'll be like, wow, but you've also enjoyed the process, the desire itself. And that, that's, that's the real key. Um, let's see. Uh, Jake says you donated to the film. Thank you, Jake, so much. Um, I really appreciate your help. Listen, I can only do what I do because of your help and support. Really, I mean, in terms of my Patreon, in terms of making this movie, I've got a comic book that I'm doing, which is purely just through the generosity of people who are helping out. So I, I so appreciate you helping me as I explore this stuff. And by the way, all the money that's made for this movie is going into the movie. You know, this is all money that will go to the director, the, the actors, the costumes, the, the music to make this happen. Um, let's see, any other questions or thoughts? Oh, Debbie says, I took philosophy in college because I was interested and it was horribly boring. So I'm glad Rob introduced us to you. Yeah, Debbie, I know it's true. I did the same. Um, sadly, I, I love university and um, obviously I spent 10 years there and uh, I, love, um, I love all of that. But sometimes it's horrifically boring. It's a subject. Philosophy is reduced to a subject. Philosophy is never supposed to be a subject. Like you start, you know, like you, a subject that you take up out of minor interest. Philosophy is about how we live, how we love, um, how we get through life together. It's, it should be the thing that kind of like it's that, you know, kind of a technology of transformation. So I had the same experience, but thankfully, um, uh, 
you know, about two years into my philosophy, I found some lecturers who really had that that feeling. I went to Queen's University, and at the time, there was a group of philosophers who really saw philosophy as a political and a cultural and as a life technology. Um, so I was very lucky. But yeah, that's why I you know don't lecture in universities. I do this stuff because. Um, you know, too often in university, philosophy is boring. Of course, there's lots of exceptions to that. But, um, uh, David says, have I missed the party? Well, you have, but you can rewatch. Um, oh, uh, Camilla says, what about, as Simone Weil said, something about the distance between heaven and earth, as in the Lord's Prayer, being bridged when we can make all that happens to us into the object of our desire. I guess that's your point. Uh, okay. Okay. I need to. I need to look up that quote. I, I love Simone Weil. Um, so that that sounds fascinating. But what you've said just can, makes me think of this. So see if this actually connects with you or not. But my my whole thing is actually in Christianity. The dilemma is solved. If I have my absurd cross, I would show you why. So I made an absurd cross, and um, basically it's got these two lines that. It's, uh, it's in, that are impossible. You know those impossible objects that you see, it, it's like a chair, but the, the legs are in such a way that you couldn't actually make it in real life. So it's like, it's an image of a chair, but, but all the lines are wrong. So it doesn't actually work. Well, I, you know, I've, so I've made a cross, it's like that. And the reason is because one of the lines is the object of desire and the other line reflects the object cause of desire and they don't fit together. And that's very, very important for me. But it's in the shape of a cross because interestingly in Christianity, the object cause of desire, the obstacle to the object of desire is Christ. Christ is the very thing we have to kill to get back to God. So you crucify Christ to get to God. But in Christianity, then you discover that the object cause of desire is the object of desire. That, that actually the very obstacle you think to your desire is your desire itself. So structurally speaking, for me, Christianity brings the object and the object cause of desire together in an interesting way. But that brings us into theology, and I'll do a talk about that sometime on Facebook Live, probably my Paro seminars, because that's a little bit too deep for Facebook Live. Um, you, I just we wouldn't have enough time to really get into it. Um, but yeah, uh, I, so but Camelia, I, I I'm interested in in how this dilemma can be resolved. Um, from a theological perspective. All right. Um, okay, I will stop there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, really, I, I uh, hope you can support the film in some way. As I said, there's lots of goodies. If for 15 bucks, you'll get to see the film. Uh, you know, a little bit more, you'll be part of a seminar. Um, I also give you a personal phone call for a little bit more. Um, and uh, you can be a, a co-producer, you can be an executive producer, um, you can get access to um, the script, uh, all of that stuff. Um, in fact, you can get access to the soundtrack. The soundtrack's being created by this amazing musician called uh, Adrian Romero, um, who is uh, uh, you know, absolutely stunning. Um, he's done incredible music for this already. So you know, there's lots of goodies to share. I hope you can be involved in that. Um, and uh, I say I'll probably do over the next four weeks a few more Facebook Lives, talking a little bit more about um, the material. I also want to talk about the director. I want to talk about the actors and all of that. So I'll leave that for a future uh, Facebook Live. All right. Take care of yourselves. Bye.